So we're ready to go. Um, I'll just wait a few minutes to let everybody get logged in. Um, Linda's, Linda's in the room, which is great. Um, and just a little housekeeping before we all get started. Don't worry, we'll be sitting out an on-demand recording of the webinar as soon as it's available. If you have any questions during the presentation, type them into the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel. We'll bring them up as they, we, uh, sometimes during the presentation if necessary, and we'll also have time for a lot of questions at the end. I encourage you all to social share with your audience members using hashtag HED leaders. And for those of you just joining us for the first time, welcome and know that we love hearing from you. This is a series of monthly on-demand virtual webinars that higher education leaders is putting on by LinkedIn Learning. Uh, we're here to help you with your skilling your students, cultivate, cultivating your organization resilience, and using learning as, learning as a catalyst for organizational change. You can register to get access to all the sessions on demand uh, at highereducationleaders.splash.com, and even the past ones will be up there. Uh, the one that's coming up next is Promoting Broadband Access, Educators as Dreamers and Activists with Paul Signorelli. That'll be on March 18th at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And Paul is a great guy who's been leading um, Arizona State University's Shaping EDU Initiative for uh, uh, broad, universal broadband access. And he's just published his book, Change the World Using Social Media. He's bringing a slew of dreamers who've become activists. Uh, it'll be a panel discussion. It'll be quite lively with people representing all parts of higher education. And so now I'm so excited to introduce myself and then to introduce Linda. Um, I'm Lori Burris. I've been consulting for LinkedIn Learning since 2009. Um, it was formerly lynda.com. I've been working with higher education initiatives and strategies for integrating LinkedIn Learning across the campus. In addition, I teach at several colleges and university, the USC Graduate Design Program, Art Center, and Otis, and I taught 22 years at Pasadena City College as head of digital media. We are so lucky today, uh, as Linda rarely agrees to do interviews. She uh, has so many other things on her plate, and she and I were both talking how we always are nervous when we do these things, and it kind of disrupts our biorhythms for a couple of days just preparing for these things. You can head to the internet and Google her if you want all the details about all of her career, but today we're starting with where she is now in her learning path. Um, and most importantly, the two of us have connected over teaching and learning way back in the 90s. I mean, decades of us becoming friends over just this passion, our love of learning. Um, I am so happy that she's here with me. She's my friend, she's my collaborator, she's oftentimes been my mentor, and she's always a source of inspiration. Alinda Wyman, welcome to our webinar today. Thank you so much, Lori. It's such a joy to be here. I know that you're going to show some slides and you can do that whenever you feel like, but I just thought I'd start off by telling everybody that what I really love about you is that you are the quintessential lifelong learner. You never stop learning and you continually share what you learn and how you learn with others. And this became clear to me when recently I, who know nothing about 3D printing in 3D printing and ceramics, signed up for a class with Linda. Linda. And we'll get more talking more about that. When you first had time off from lynda.com, your focus was on film producing, often stories inspired by and created by women. So what caused you to shift to your new passion, ceramics? Um, what got you what got you re-motivated or re-inspired to, to look into that area? You know, it might just be a good time for me to do my presentation because I kind of tell that whole story. Oh, good, good, good. And I think yeah, it sets it. up context for the rest of the conversation. So am I allowed to share my screen? Yeah, you have every privilege that I have. Okay, so I'm going to um, share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yep, we can see it. Okay. So um, I threw pots in high school. And for me, it was really a healing thing. And you know how everybody probably says, when I retire, when I get old and I can do whatever I want, I'm gonna go back to X. My X was ceramics. And 
uh, it, it kind of came to me again because my husband has been designing a house with a architect, Robin Donaldson. And um, I was a little bit jealous of the happiness that he had. I want him to be happy, but I could see that he was really living his passion to build this house. And it was so exciting to him. And even though I was doing films, which I love doing, I was producing films, it wasn't the same as creating something. I mean, we created lynda.com together. I just hadn't realized that I had this big empty void in myself where I wasn't creating anything. And so I took, uh, so I asked him, could I have a ceramic studio in the house that we're designing? And he was like, sure. So then I thought, uh oh, I better make sure that I really like ceramics because I haven't done it since high school. <laughs> So this was my very first pot that I threw at a workshop um, about two and a half years ago. It was at a, a community college. And I, I was really unhappy with the class actually. And it didn't excite me very much, but I went online and I started looking for other ceramics classes. And I found Anderson Ranch and they have what's called a fab lab, which is a fabrication lab, a digital fabrication lab. And I found this amazing sounding class um, to make digitally fabricated molds on using 3D software. And um, I didn't know what it meant, but I just thought I have to do this. And so I signed up and um, these are some of the images from the workshop. Um, that was my PC that I brought with me and I'm a Mac girl, so that was a real challenge. Um, but there I was first exposed to rhino and grasshopper and also exposed to a lot of things about ceramics that I had never done before, such as making a plaster mold. This is my very first plaster mold and um, there I am proudly displaying it. And then we were working with a CNC machine, which is a computer driven mill that takes a computer, you know, whatever you design in the 3D software and it mills it out of the plaster. So there's my little plaster um, brick there. And this is our teacher, Del Harrow. And this is an example of clay that has been put into one of these molds from a digital file. This was one of my first files that I made. And here I am making my very first press mold, which is pressing the clay into this mold that I made. And this was, um, my my uh, result and then I got it back from firing and it broke and so my very first thing broke which is I I have learned to really embrace these mistakes and understanding how mistakes really help you learn then I made um, this file and this was milled out of foam and um, this is um, me taking my mold out of or uh, separating the foam from the plaster casting and there I am with a very big smile on my face. This is an example of the mold being tied together and you pour liquid clay into this and then you come out with a mold where you can make pots you know, over and over again with the same mold. And these were the pieces that I made in this class. Well, I, I wanna get back to the house because the house that Bruce is designing is a parametric house is probably one of the only parametric houses in the United States. And um, what that means is that it is um, made completely in the computer. And this is a little uh, mock-up. It has a living roof. It's in the shape of a sand dollar. It has curves everywhere, very few straight lines. Um, and it was made from molds. And what I realized when I took the class, I had an epiphany that I was making my ceramic molds exactly the same way that our house was being built. Even this um, interior ribbing for the walls is CNC cut. It's cut on one of these same, a similar device to what I used when I was doing my um, ceramics. So parametric design is kind of a big buzzword. There's no one agreed upon definition of it. But I'm holding, you know, just putting some of these up, which you, you can read. Um, but it's basically, you know, curvy, um, no, uh, no symmetry, um, very organic. Um, and actually the grandfather of parametric design is Antonio Gaudi. And he did it without computers. He did it um, by, you know, 
putting draping string and and what are called bird shots into these little bags and figuring out his curves that way. So the, this one little class that I took at the ranch, it really changed my life because I felt like, okay, I can do 3D graphics. I know all of the graphics tools. And even if I don't know them, I know I can learn them. Um, I know nothing about ceramics, but uh, you know that's soon going to change. So while I was there, I uh, went on a hike to the Bells, which is um, you know, this beautiful setting in Colorado near the ranch. And the woman in the middle, her name is Elaine Quave. And she was telling me that at her high school, she was a high school teacher, she taught something called a 3D Potter Bot. And these are the different um, models that 3D Potter, Potter Bot sells. And um, I uh, had, had sort of an epiphany while I was at the ranch that even though I was getting this home studio to be built for me in this new amazing parametric house, um, I really loved working with other people and I learned so much from being in this group setting. And so um, I learned the importance of having a community around learning, a learning community. And so um, I called up Patrick Hall who had had a organization called Clay Studio and he had had to close it. It was a community clay studio in Goleta because his um, lease had uh, expired and they were doing something different with the building and they, they needed him to leave. So he had all these kilns in storage and wheels. And I had been on his wait list for about a year and I called him up from the ranch and I said, you know, I know you're probably having trouble getting a new space because maybe the rent is too high, but I really want to have a community clay studio and I could afford to pay the rent. And so maybe we can do a trade where you set it up and I pay the rent. And anyway, long story short, we found a, we found a building to buy. It's 28,000 square feet. It's turned into this really amazing, amazing clay studio. Um, and um, I ended up buying a Scara, which is the largest um, 3D Potter bot. And this is um, our very first print that we ever made at Clay Studio on our, on our Scara. And it was from um, a place called Thingiverse. You can download models. So we didn't make this model. Um, and then, you know, this was another piece that we um, made that same day. And this was from a um, model that we did make um, that I made in Fusion 360, which is what I was using at the time. I've, I've since switched over to Rhino. Um, but anyway, it's very mesmerizing to watch the clay print. And um, sadly, about two weeks after uh, the center opened, COVID hit and we all got sent home. And so um, I was, uh, I called the 3D Potter bot. I already had the bug. I was like, this is what I wanna do. I know this is what I wanna do. And I asked Bruce, can, can I convert our dining room? We're not gonna be using it during COVID into a clay studio and he agreed. So this is something that he posted on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, and it was from when we first moved into our house. We don't even have chairs around our dining room, but it kind of shows you, and I didn't have gray hair, and you know, this is an old picture, um, but it kind of shows you the room where it's happening. And then I'm a very messy person, but this is my studio. As of last night, I took this photo. And so you can see that the, um, I have a printer there in the very far end of it, and this is, um, where I do a lot of stuff, a lot of different things. This is an example of printing something in my studio and printing something else in my studio. This is my garage, which um, I also then asked, oh, I think I need a kiln and I think I want a, a, um, a pugger where you mix the clay. And so I took my space where I normally park my car and it is now also converted into my clay studio. And then this is the entry to our house and it also has, converted. So I've really kind of turned our home into a big play studio. And then these are some of the tools that I use today. I'm using Rhino, which is the modeling part of the side of the uh, software, and then Grasshopper, which is uh, a, a visual way of connecting scripts where you can make dynamic and parametric um, uh, objects. And this is another tool that I use a lot, Potterware. And this is what Lori learned when she took my class and what I taught on class. And um, I, I had noticed when I started to make things in Potterware, I started with Potterware, that they didn't turn out like how they looked in Potterware. So this is a model, and then that's my object. 
And so you really have to make sort of a mental interpolation of what um, your piece is gonna look like and it's with a lot of trial and error. Um, I noticed when people would post on Instagram or wherever these amazing 3D images that they never showed their models. And I, I tried to understand, you know, this is a model that I made in Fusion and this is another model. Um, and then these are how they print. So to me, there was a very big disconnect between what they looked like in the model and how they were gonna actually print. So I started a blog and my blog is at uh, claybotris.com and I have chronicled a lot of my learning on the blog. And I also now have a YouTube channel where I've recorded a lot of videos for Potterware. And um, this is the, uh, also helped set up a tutorial section for the Potterware software with the founders. And, um, and so, um, so a lot of my videos are on this, uh, on this site now. So now I'm gonna show you some of the, uh, the pieces that I've made. Now keep in mind, I got my first clay printer in March, 2020. It is February, 21. So this is to me just truly remarkable. I did not own a kiln. I did not own a pug mill. I had never done this kind of ceramics before. And, you know, I have a really good friend who is, has been a potter for about 40 years and she's like, you're making forms that potters need to work decades to learn how to make. And I'm making them right out the gate. So there's a lot of learning to it, but it's also really gratifying because you kind of can come out making all this incredible, beautiful stuff. I also have really embraced all my mistakes. That's kind of a theme of something that I write about a lot on the blog and something that I believed in my teaching philosophy too. Like when I st first started making videos, I would often show my mistakes because my students are gonna encounter mistakes and sometimes learning from your teacher making a mistake and also having permission that mistakes are okay. But in here, this is called wabi-sabi where, wabi where you just embrace the imperfection and I've been using gold glaze to gild my imperfections and have a whole bunch of those. Um, but this is just a whole series of different things that I've made with both Potterware and Rhino and Grasshopper. And it just kind of gives you um, a idea of, you know, some of the, some of the things that are, that are possible. Um, well, they're so, they're amazing. It's an, and it's amazing. Like you I said, mean, how you were me. They, they totally amaze me. You know, it's hard when someone compliments you and you're like, oh, you really look good. And you're like, nah, my hair is messy. Or, you know, you always like deflect, deflect. And when people say that they're amazing, I have to agree because I'm amazed by them. And, you know, I ask people when I give them to them to send me their, their pictures in the wild. This is just, you know, loading my kiln and, um, you know, some of my different pieces. And um, I think I kind of, end this with showing a new series that I'm working on. Um, I also got a laser cutter and a plotter and a cricket, which like cut a cutting machine. And, you know, I'm just sort of all now really into this whole idea. Oh, you got to stop on this slide. Ex explain yeah, I'm this talk slide, about this. That That is why, why I stopped. Um, because I, I, I was asked to make a trophy for a tournament for a, a nonprofit that I'm part of. And I had to work kind of hard to make a, a trophy because when you make something in the 3D printer, it has to be one continuous piece of clay that goes in a spiral. And so it was a little hard with the handles and everything. And I ended up making a very beautiful, pristine, perfect one. But in the process, I thought, you know, this is a great metaphor, a trophy that you give yourself something or you receive when you do something great. But what about a trophy for your failures, a, pro a trophy for your attempts? a trophy for the things that you tell yourself that are negative, you know? And so I made this series uh, called uh, the Imperfect Awards, the Insecurity Awards. And um, it's, a, it's a series that I plan to, plan to continue. Um, I've also been exploring a lot of grasshopper scripts and this is my newest body of work, which I think looks a lot like it's knitted or it has yarn. And um, what I'm doing is I'm using, um, grayscale images. So this is a pot that was made from that grayscale image. So the, the, the spots where it's protruding are where the white is in this, in this uh, image. And this is another one 
where I made the dots more noisy. And so it made these sort of um, less, more random kinds of loops. And um, so I now have, you know, a whole series of these that I'm working on and I'm really, really excited about because I, um, because I love, um, let me stop sharing. Uh, okay, stop sharing. Because I, I really um, love how clay is not perfect. Like one of the things I was looking at Gaudi and I was looking at how, even though he made this parametric architecture, it looks so organic. It looks so handmade. It, it's something really magical that the computer has a hard time getting. When I look at those pristine forms on the computer in Rhino or, or, or Grasshopper or wherever, they don't excite me as much as the clay, which then returns it to this more organic, beautiful um, combination of, of, of craft and tech. And so um, yeah, I, I've just- I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah, it's yeah. just, a, it's it's when you take two different media and put intersect them, you get something new that you haven't seen before. I was yeah. so excited to watch you learn this and so excited I signed up for your class and I've made my first potterware. Um, do you have your, but do you have your went, pot? Do you have it there? Not, not, near, not nearby me, oh. but I've made one guys, I'll post it later. This is yeah. all about you today. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, how does it feel when you first start learning something new that you, aren't good at doing. For a lot of us, there's a lot of barriers or self-doubt. What do you-, you, what know, do you I have to tell a story because at Anderson Ranch, you're supposed to show your air quotes portfolio. And my portfolio was that one dumb thing that I threw in that community college class. I did not have a portfolio. And I stood up and, and started to explain like, oh, I did this in high school and like, I'm being called to do this. And you know, I know tech and I'm comfortable with that. And I actually got like choked up and teary. I had so much shame about not, not knowing and, and being among these amazing artists and feeling like I was an imposter and I didn't belong. And, um, you know, it was, it was something I wanted, like, you know, with, with doing films, which I loved doing producing films, I felt like I didn't have that much Sometimes I would talk with the filmmaker and suggest an edit or, you know, this or that, but it just didn't feel like it was, I had ownership of it, but my ownership was that I wanted to do art, but I wasn't an artist and I wasn't a good at anything yet. Um, but I knew that I wanted to do it. And it was like my lifelong kind of bucket list thing that I wanted to do. Um, another factor in my life is that I'm married to an amazing artist. And so he, that was really intimidating to me. And you know, he asked me, well, when we build the ceramic studio for you, can I come use it? And I was like, no way, I don't want to compete with you. You know, I'll never be as good as you. Well, I've let all that go, but it's been a journey. It's, it's kind of getting back to that thing when someone compliments you and they say you look good and you're like, no, my hair is messy or, you know, I have a wart here or I'm 20 pounds overweight or whatever it is. Um, you know, like to accept that you are entitled to be an artist, that you have every right to do it and that you have talent, whatever that is. You know, you're for me, I think talent is a word that is really misunderstood. And talent is, um, is something that you practice and you develop and you hone. You do not, you're not born with talent. Talent is something that is um, earned and it's also, you have to work hard for it. And so, yes, I definitely have a talent for this. And however, I still know that I'm, I'm doing this under a year and I know who my, you know, who the, my predecessors are. And I, I have an understanding of art. I've, you know, know a lot yeah, about art. Yeah, it's a combination of a lot forever. of- And, you know, I, I, I know who, I know who, who the, uh, you know, who the parents are of this, you know, who my mentors are and who my, who, who to look up to, well, I to also know that what I'm doing is good. And that's a really, that, that was hard to come to that point, but I, I'm there now. Which I think 
all of us struggle with this. I mean, we all have like an angel and a devil on our shoulder. Um, Linda and I at one point took a yoga class together and by far were the worst people in the yoga class. But our teacher sat us down and gave us this lecture on practice, not perfection. And when you were talking, it reminded me of how she sort of, you know, she has two, two 90% good girls who like 90% to be right all the time. And we're not good at this. And she was just saying, it's a practice. It's a practice. You're, you're, you're like do, doing all your judgment judging on outside, not looking at your inside and what it means to you, which is what you just explained. But that inner critic yeah. is is so hard to get over. And also it's there for a reason. You know, I mean, Mar being married to Bruce, he has always told me about, you know, you have to let go of your bad work. Like it is, it, it's like, if it isn't working, let it go. You can't just keep, um, you know, trying to make it better when it just isn't working. And and so, you know, but you also, I think to be a good artist, you have to be critical. You can't just love everything that you do. And it took me a long time. My friend Dara, I don't know if she's on the call, but um, she told me, cause she came to the studio and saw all the stuff that I was hand building and stuff and said, you know, Linda, you don't have to save every one of every piece you've ever made. And it was like, but they're all so precious to me still because I'm so new at this. And now that I have been doing this for, I'm so seasoned the whole year, you know, but in COVID, I feel like I've really gotten a chance to dig in and dig in deeper than I could have in a normal year. Um, right. But and I you, things you, away all the time. You've done yeah. hundreds. I just want people to know yes. we're not talking about 10 or 20. We're talking hundreds. Yeah, so totally. one of the things I love about you, and we both do this, when we, one of the things what Linda has this habit of, if, if she has a question, on her learning path. She's not afraid to go ask it. Um, you have a mentor right now. I do. You actually meet with your mentor. You, I, I thought you should tell that story just to let people know you're not afraid to ask for help. <laughs> yeah. And also, I mean, I did teach myself a lot on YouTube in the beginning, YouTube. And, um, you know, I had never loaded a kill. I had never fired a, my own kill. And I suddenly had a kiln and I had to learn and I like watched all these YouTube videos on how to load it and how to, you know, how to set the timer and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there came a point with my, um, with my work in, in 3D, um, well, I had two sort of issues. One between Potterware and the slicers that I was using, which is what you take your 3D model and you slice it so that the 3D printer can understand it. It has to go through um, a really archaic uh, type of coding called G-code, which has been around since the 1950s. And it basically tells stepper motors where to go. So it tells, uh, it, it converts my circle and makes it into maybe like a hundred different coordinates for where the machine should go around to make the circle. So you use this software called slicing software to make G-code. And I was noticing that the walls were really thin when I would print in things like Cura or Slice in programs like Cura, programs like um, Simplify 3D. And, but when I would use Potterware, which was that more intuitive software that you learned in the class I taught, the walls were really beautiful and thick and strong and they had integrity. And so I was like, why? And I kept calling, I called, you know, Potterbot who makes the, the robotic uh, printer. And they were like, you know, this really isn't our thing. We make the printer, we don't make the software, but maybe you want to talk to Ron Rael who uh, made Potterware. And so I wrote to Potterware and I didn't really know if I'd get a, a response and I did, it was very nice. And I was asking for a couple of features and, um, and he was, you know, explaining to me that why they weren't going to probably happen very soon and stuff and, and, uh, questioned why I wanted them and stuff like that. Um, and then, um, fortunately one of the guys back at Potterbot said, maybe you should talk to Ron Rael's research assistant, Sandy, uh, Sandy Kurth, who, um, who uh, I didn't realize had just gotten his master's at Berkeley in architecture and, was about to go to MIT to um, get his doctorate in 3D clay printing, okay? And he was one of the writers of Potterware. So he, I sort of hit the gold mine of the, of the person that I wanted to work with. And I had no idea if we would click or you know what it was gonna be like, but we ended up, um, we worked together every week. And um, you know, I, I, I feel my brain stretching in every which direction and, Eventually stuff sticks. It doesn't come, you know, all the time easily to me. 
Um, but with his help, that's in a huge, you know, it's been an uh, amplifier of how fast I've been able to ramp up. And I'm very lucky to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one tutor. You know, most people don't have that luxury. But I think that's a really important thing that when, as teachers, as learners, we're usually pretty excited. We've talked about this. We're excited about what we're learning and we're excited about sharing it. And he was excited that you were excited about what he was doing. Um, <laughs> and so often we think that somebody out there is someone unreachable. And we, when we just simply ask for help, they're willing to do this. I see this all the time when I'm teaching students, this inability to ask for help or seek help or ask more questions. And I was so, I, it's just one of the things I love about you. You're never afraid to seek help. Uh, I think it's such an important tool. Um, so one of the things I noticed that this is really different, you and Bruce had a business together and now you're on the solo path. How is that, how is a solo path kind of different and what do you like about it or don't like about it? I mean, how's this been for you as a personal journey? It's been a huge personal journey, just this journey from going from, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, you know, how to, you know, why am I doing this to, um, you know, really owning it. And it's, and it just, nothing gives me so much joy is seeing Bruce brag about my pots, you know, like he'll bring people over and he'll show them this one and that one and explain things. And it's just, it, it almost makes me cry because I just never thought I could, I could hold my own in this arena. And um, now I know I can, and it's actually a whole new area to connect with him on because, um, you know, I've, I've been married to an artist as a non-artist, and now I'm married to an artist as another artist. And it's a really beautiful other form of connection that we now have uh, in, a, in a wonderful, you know, marriage that I feel extremely grateful for. Yeah, and what's great about it is we talked a little bit about this, that creativity needs an audience. <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> part of being an ex expressive person is knowing other people out there have seen your work. I mean, you've already, like, you're on two shows, you're collaborating <laughs> with people, you know, like, I mean, talk a little bit about, like, you know, you're so excited that people are looking at what you're doing and what that means. Yeah, I mean, it's really been um, you know, overwhelming, to be honest. Um, it happened so fast. I just never dreamed that, uh, you know, I would get any kind of recognition. But, um, you know, I am a known person in our community, uh, you know, high profile person, because we had our company and, and it sold, we employed so many people in town, we sponsored so many events. So a lot of people are, you know, just curious and interested in in and in, in continue, seeing where where the journey goes because, you know, you, when you know somebody, I mean, I've known a few people who've gotten famous and and uh, wealthy and all of that, and you know, there is this sort of curiosity about well, what are they going to do and and what are they doing? So I get that 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 that's uh, an amplifier, but I also think the work is truly interesting and. And what I'm doing with it is interesting and it's truly beautiful. I mean, um, I think it's it's beautiful and it's why I'm so addicted to it. I just can't stop thinking about it and making it. So um, I, I have gotten more attention than I, than I probably deserve, but um, it's funny because I won't take, I won't take a speaking engagement about lynda.com. I, you know, you said I rarely speak um, I'm, I, I've told that story. You can, you can go watch YouTube videos about it. You can read about it. It's over. This is me today. I'm, I'm somebody different. I'm not, you know, in my past. I'm in my present. So um, I don't, and also I don't have anything to sell or promote or prove. And so, you know, for a lot of artists who are so hungry to get a show, so hungry to make a sale, I'm really sheepish about it. It's like, okay, I'll sell it if it goes to the charity of my 3D pottery studio that is a nonprofit. You know, um, that makes me feel really good that I can raise money for them. Um, but, uh, you know, there is sort of this very odd, I mean, I'm in a very rare, odd situation where I don't need to work. I understand what an incredible privilege that is but I'm actually working harder than I worked um oh, you, ever every, I, I I'm just letting you know up, I wake up <laughs> and I and I'm on the you know I'm doing stuff and there's a lot of pieces of this that are not on the computer which I just love you know glazing and 
and doing the kiln and and photographing the pieces and um, you know letting them dry and I mean there's so much sort of like Karen Handley preparing the clay. Um, there's just I I just never am at a loss of anything to do. I just absolutely love it. It's totally engaging. She is 24 seven on this. When she had the company, Bruce and Linda were 24 seven. I can say I worked with them. We all, that's all we ever talked about when I was with them, whether whether it was breakfast, lunch or dinner. But this, now she's 24 seven on this. And what I like about it, and I've watched this transition because I've been with you as a friend on this journey, looking from outside in, is that you could have said, I've got three forms I like and just made a million of them and colored them different colors. But you're really now in that last series of work, you're really pushing the boundaries. There is there is something about using the computer. And this is to everybody out there using computers. How can we make people have multi-sensory experiences? How can we touch something that's more soulful and more internal? And you're really trying with code and with these high-end 3D things to 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 look to push the boundaries because you know i took her class and we went out and there's lots of stuff that looks the same from potterware you know any any one of us could make exactly the same pot so the fact that you're actually pushing boundaries um you're, you know you're always a pioneer and that's my kind of last question before we go to q a you've okay. been such a pioneer in everything you've tried to do from the first minute you decided you read the book summer hill and you'd pick out your your high school to you start a company in ojai which didn't make any sense to now you're doing potterware in your dining room and having and coding while you're doing it so how what can you do you have any advice for people who need who want those challenges but are afraid to live on that edge I mean, all I can say is, you know, when you find it, you know, it's sort of, um, if you don't have it, you know, you don't have it. And if you have it, you know, you do have it. Um, it's, it's, it's like everything in your body tells you, I love this. And if you're in a job you don't like, or you're in a career, you know, you're in a whole career that you're, you realize you don't like. I mean, I noticed one person on the, I've, I've just been seeing names fly by. I can't read the chat while we're doing this, but I saw Jan Kabili who's on the call. And I met her at Anderson Ranch when Bruce and I were teaching there. We taught um, a class in, I think it was in, um, might've been in web design or else it was in Photoshop. And Jan was my teaching assistant, but she had just gone to law school and was, and realized she didn't want to be a lawyer. And, you know, that she loved photography. And so now she's some, you know, high up mucky muck at Adobe doing her exact right. job that she wants in, in digital but photography. But it kind of goes back to your original yeah. point that sometimes we confuse the, which Bruce was making the point, if Bruce was around, I would say this. If we put a lot of time in things and think that means we have to stay there, that that makes it more valuable. That yeah. being able to say, you know what? I've explored everything I can do here time to move move forward whether it's in personal relationships or what we're learning or the goals well, that we're setting also, for ourselves. you know all i can say is i mean i know this has a really been a terrible um year for the majority of people and um you know i i it's a weird thing to have had a i've had the most magical year because i've had all this time to learn something and I've and I've been away from people and I've been away from social engagements and away from dinners and away from all this stuff. And I and I just loved it because for me, it's so rare. Like I've had been such a extroverted social out there person for so long. This has just been the biggest amazing gift. But I realize it's you know, I say that with full understanding of my privilege that I am in a situation where I have a roof over my head and I don't have to worry about food and you know all of the things that so many people are, are struggling with but um i i feel i i kind of forgot my point but um something about just this endorphins that you get when you're teaching yourself something new and you're doing something new and you're doing the thing that you really love um it is a happiness manufacturer it it is hard to be depressed when you're having so much just fun i'm i i've just literally so lit up i mean bruce remembers me because we when when he was in college and i was teacher um you know he was helping me research my very first book and i was so lit up 
learning about the web and, and web graphics and what's this color thing. And it was all this research and figuring it out. And he's like, I haven't seen you lit up like this since I first met you. And so the, isn't that amazing that at my stage in life, I've found this thing that just lights me up like this. It's, um, and, I, and I don't know how, I, I feel really lucky that I found it, but I knew, I knew when I didn't have it. And I knew that I was sort of, you know, unhappy in this weird underlying way, even though I was doing cool stuff. I liked what I was doing. I didn't love what I was doing. So now I love it. And I wish that for everyone. I mean, I know it's maybe an impossible dream, but. Um, well, that it, ex you know, actually is a, the lucky. perfect description of really good learning when you really love what you are, that True. you're in that you're present in that moment. And motivation isn't a problem. It's like, I don't want to leave to do something else. I mean, that's a really good state to be in. Um, thank you so much. We're going to open it up to q and I know there's a lot of questions cool. out there. I don't know, Chris or Elma, who's going to ask, the, tell us what's in the Q&A? Because clearly, Linda and I cannot do it. Um, <laughs> you're going to. Well, we do have quite a bit of questions in the Q&A, and uh, a few of them have been ranked. And the number one question that everyone wants to know from Linda is would Linda consider coming back to LinkedIn to author a masterclass on 3D pottery and the philosophy of design? I know you're trying to stay away from, you know, but- That's a really interesting invitation. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a really full circle moment, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I'm not gonna say yes on the call, but I, I'm very intrigued. I'll, I'll think about that. She is already making tutorials and videos. I mean, if you haven't checked out that Potterware, I kept saying, "This is." She made this video. She made that video. I was very happy to see that you were still tied to to video learning and and how it's so accessible to people. Well, I started um, writing, and you know, video it's just so much faster. It's so much more direct. Like you start writing something out, and you're like, "This is painstaking." I want to just you know get in with my recorder and say what I know and show it, say it, show it, and uh, you know, be done with it. Also, in the class, she did mention the three-day workshop that I took with her. It's it's such a it teachers out there. It's an awesome responsibility to do it right. Day to class. do it. Well, it seemed like two and a half days, um, but I mean, just <laughs> it seemed like more. <laughs> I'm, I mean, it is an awesome it is an awesome job, but it has full of responsibility. You know, to the learner. It's it's you know you took it so seriously. Uh, Elma, some more questions. Yes, there are quite a few more questions. Our next question comes from Jorn London. Uh, she says, or he says, it's so great to see you again. And of course, we're all very happy to see you again, Linda, and to hear your inspirational new journey. Um, but Jorn wants to know, you have changed my life. How do you see yourself as a role model for lifelong learners? What would be your piece of advice? What would be my what? Piece of advice about... Um, being a lifelong oh. learner, your advice to us. About oh, um, I mean, I think I've learner. just been saying my advice is, is um, you know, find something you really love and, and go deep. And um, the deeper you go, because most things are infinite, really. Um, I know this new journey that I'm on is infinite. I don't, I cannot imagine ever growing tired of it, but, um, uh, you know, just keep on, keep on doing it because there is no end to learning ever. It's, it is, it is a forever. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, next question. There are quite a few, so hopefully we'll be able to get through most of them. I'm kind of rank based on ranking. Our next question is from Lynn Grillo and she um, asked, perhaps this I is know. an indelicate question, but it seems like there may be a very high dollar cost that goes along with this craft is that accurate a very high what kind of cost dollar are they dollar. is oh, equipment dollar. expensive yes oh it, yes mm -hmm. um yes i would i would agree that it is a high dollar um i mean look i'll throw out some of the numbers like potterware is the software is 300 dollars a year not bad if you get into rhino and grasshopper you're probably talking more about a thousand dollars if you get the creative suite suite you know, seven, 800, because I, I am using a uh, creative suite still. Um, like you saw, I was making grayscale maps and I do illustrator, um, those pieces with my glasses, I made the glasses in illustrator. Um, so, and then the machine is um, the Potter bot. I think they start, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I think 
the low end ones are like three to four thousand dollars and the high end ones can go you know the really big ones can go way up but the one that I have in my living room I think is I mean in my dining room I think is maybe four thousand dollars um hope I'm not wrong and then um the kiln is going to be about you know five six thousand dollars a um if you're going to get a pug mill, which is great for mixing the clay to the right consistency, that's another uh, four to six thousand uh, dollars. Unless you buy them used, there's a lot of things that you can buy can buy used. But yes, I think it is a high dollar cost. Uh, but again, that gets back to that idea of the studio community. I mean, um, definitely. Uh, you know, she's got the clay studio in Goleta, there's Anderson Ranch, there's every community college. Um, but even in talking to her mentor, and when I took the class, he was saying how K through 12 teachers had been embracing it as a as a as an alternative to, um, and they're thinking of it, you graphic designers out there, it's a service bureau, you don't own the, the machine, you send Correct. your files to the machine. So Very there's a good point. And we are like that at clay studio, we do, you know, in Goleta, especially when things open back up. Um, I, there is a price to send your file and have something printed and fired. Um, but when we open back up, um, which is hopefully gonna be, you know, this year sometime, I hope, um, you know, then people can go there and use it like, like a service bureau. So Emma, let's try to get three more questions in and then we'll get Linda in and out the door. I promised her we would not go over. Oh, so no worries. Another, um, uh, folks are curious to know where you get your inspiration for your pieces. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, sometimes I have a really specific idea and it just comes to me, like I'll wake up thinking about it. Like some of the, um, the new things that I'm working on with the grayscale images, um, you know, I'm enjoying modeling with grayscale, like thinking about instead of modeling with, um, you know, my geometry and my 3D modeling application to be more like painting with grays and making shapes that way. Um, so that's really intriguing to me. And sometimes it's more of like a technique, like, oh, I wonder if I could get irregular loops. And sometimes it's, um, I want to make a plate for, you know, this purpose or um, the thing like the trophy, like that series kind of came to me really out of the air because I was making a perfect trophy. And then I just realized what an amazing metaphor the trophy is. And so they come from all different places. Um, I'm not, you know, having an idea necessarily and sitting down and executing on my exact idea. And I'm also really open to serendipity and really open to um, you know, the thing about the parametric uh, design in Grasshopper is that things are on a lever. So, you know, you can say, I want the loop to be, uh, let's try it this size. No, let's move it to that size. And it kind of animates in and out. And it's like, you are designing it, but you don't know why or how it's coming through you. And it's just a flow. Yeah, if any of you coders are out there, it's like algorithms and variables where you start tweedling your variables and you can come up with new things. Or great, thank you. Our next question would be, what do you, uh, and a few folks have been asking this, what do you think the common value or passion is between the work you started out doing with lynda.com and what you do now? Um, I think the common, uh, value is that I did what I loved, <laughs> you know? I mean, there were so many similarities when I got my first Mac, you know, I was one of the really early adopters. I got it literally the year it came out, um, 1984. <laughs> and um, maybe it was 1985, I don't know. And um, I, uh, I just couldn't stop learning about it. I was on fire and, and then when people started saying, well, how'd you do that? I'm like, oh, they don't, you know, okay, I, uh, here's how I did it. And then they were like, that was amazing. You know, how did you do the next thing? And I sort of felt like I was elected to be a teacher. I didn't know consciously that I was a teacher. It was because I was excited about something. And then I had a talent for explaining it. And then people felt they were learning from me. And it was really just this accidental discovery. It wasn't going into it almost like the pots or like how I design, you know, it was just like a thing that happened. 
And then I went with it. I was like, oh, well, I love doing this. Are you kidding? I can get paid to teach software that I want to learn anyway. Uh, sure. You know, I actually felt like I was getting away with something kind of like, I feel like I'm getting away with something when I get invited to shows and stuff right now, you know, it's like this, oh, I don't quite own it. But then, you know, I was a teacher. Um, I did lynda.com for 20 years and I was in the teaching industry for more like 30. So at the end of that time, I owned it 100% felt like I was, you know, yeah, I'm a good teacher and I know good, I know other, the other thing was I could recognize other good teachers and knew the difference between bad and good, just like I'm learning the difference between bad and good form and all the things that I'm learning in art, you know, it's the same sort of thing. You, you the years and years do help you um, get secure and, and where you feel that you are mastering something or you are really at the top of your, of your game. But I also knew with lynda.com, like at the end of it, um, for me in the last few years, I knew that I wanted another chapter. I wanted to do something else besides that. And I don't feel that way yet at all with the 3D pottery. And I don't know if I ever will, but um, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> uh, piggybacking on that answer, um, have you considered writing a book about your journey building lynda.com? Feels like there are so few books written by women about building and selling a company. Yeah, I, I've got one started and half done. And, um, you know, I just got asked this question recently by a good friend um, to write the whole life story because more than just Linda, but, you know, just the whole pro the whole uh, journey. And um, I, I don't know, like I, I think for right now, I'm busy doing. So I don't wanna be um, rehashing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And there may come a point in my life where, I'll, where I will want to do that. But um, I listen to my gut and my heart. That's kind of what drives me. I'm a super intuitive person and I'm big emp emp empath. Um, and so my gut right now is that I wanna be doing this work and um, not so much teaching, writing, rehashing. Uh, now, you know, who knows, there may come a, a day where I decide that I want to and I, and I know that I could and that I would, uh, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. So not, not right away. <laughs> and thanks Linda for that. And of course, everyone's so inspired. And so our last question for the day, um, everyone wants to know can, where can they buy your, your pots, your work, <laughs> even as um, towards a donation to the, yeah, we're yeah. all really wanting to know where can we buy your, well, there are a few pieces right now for sale on, um, on clay studio SB as in Santa Barbara, clay studio SB.org. And um, in, on their website, you'll see there's an artist store and I am one of the artists. I don't have a lot up there at the moment. Um, I've, I'm, my inventory is a little bit low, but I will put things up there. And what I do is I um, post on Facebook and I post on Instagram when I upload work to the store. And, um, and so if you follow me in those places, um, then you might find, you know, you might find out, but they have been going fast. Um, which is also shocking to me, but, but anyway, um, it is possible to buy them occasionally. They're, they're really hard to buy. Listen, I, as one person who's tried to buy, I was able to enroll in her class though. That was even hard <laughs> to get in the class before it full, uh, closed. So Linda, and the class thank is you being so taught again. The class yeah, is being taught yeah. again. I'm not teaching it. I, one of my the same curriculum. Teaching it. Yeah, same well, curriculum, yeah. but also this is so beautiful that I taught Erica Ailes, how to use the um, 3D printer. And she's an amazing artist and doing incredible work on it. And then she has turned around and she is teaching the class that she was my teaching assistant for. So it's, it's you know, continuing on, which but is that's, beautiful. But that's part of lifelong learning. It's not just the personal it. path. Every time we share learning with someone else, it goes off. To, it's just got this huge ripple effect. It's so great. It's, it's amazing. It's, 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 it's like one of the most generous things you can do. Anyway, I want to thank you and everyone in attendance. And I'm going to do just some shameless promotion to let you know that we do have some 
courses on lifelong learning on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, we don't have Linda's course on her uh, Rhino and Potterware. We don't have any 3D printing yet. I don't, not, not like what you're doing, not as depth Why don't you just put that. this up on LinkedIn Learning? You know, you have a recording. Why don't you guys just, just uh, post well, we, this? They, they will, they'll be up, they'll be up and we'll be promoting it forever. <laughs> um, and it was sort of like being at a reunion. There were lots of, of people from lynda.com and from all over the universe that I've met through Linda. So it was great to see all of you. And then just to, to remind you, we're doing these monthly. Next month is the promoting broadband access. But if we could all do a virtual clap for Linda, thank you, Linda. You are so wonderful. And I'm inspired every time I'm around you. It's just, it's just a joy to be your friend and to watch your journey and to watch you learn. Thank you so much for today.